I'm going to start this by reading some stuff from Ron Paul's and the Fed. Some stuff is going to be left out because it's old and it's a lot worse now. So the figures he uses are like old and it's a lot worse now. But our money has gone bad. Our financial system is a mess. Abuse of power and abuse of money bring a nation down. More people are coming to understand that the Federal Reserve is responsible for the crisis we're in and that it must be ended. With growth now decreasing rapidly and U.S. government debt expanding by trillions of dollars each year, this number will quickly soar. Today, we would be hard-pressed to find any movement in the right direction by our leaders. Just in the past year, we've had a barrage of new programs, all based on bigger government, more dollar debasement, and greater power given to the Fed and executive branch of government. These new federal programs include the Primary Dealer Credit Facility, the Term Auction Facility, the Term Securities Lending Facility, and the Asset-Backed Commercial Paper Money Market Mutual Fund Liquidity Facility. These are in addition to the routine technique of low interest rates and low reserve requirements directed by the Federal Reserve to keep the new money flowing. It's sad because our future hangs in the balance and what we do is crucial to the outcome. Congress passed the first stimulus package of more than $100 billion in 2008. The Troubled Asset Relief Program, TARP, of $700 billion became law in October 2008. Just to pause here to remind you that they called a thing that they were using to cover over a bad financial system TARP. The new administration promised to pass another stimulus package early in 2009 worth up to a trillion dollars. It is engaging in every manner of tricky finance that will end in effectively nationalizing the banking system. Despite the fact that there are no beneficial results, the worse the economy gets, the greater are the demands for more of the same. The total commitment at the end of 2009 will exceed $9 trillion. There is another path, but it requires a complete turnaround. It requires only the political will to unplug the machinery of the Fed. Contrary to what people might think at first, this will not mean an end to the financial system as we know it. In a post-Fed world, we will still have the dollar, banks, ATMs, online trading, web-based systems of fund transfer. None of this is going anywhere. What will be added to this system will be vastly more financial options that are currently being kept at bay, including trading and contracting in many different currencies and new sounder investment opportunities. When we unplug the Fed, the dollar will stop its long depreciating trend. International currency values will stop fluctuating wildly. Banking will no longer be a dice game, and financial power will cease to gravitate toward a small circle of government-connected insiders. The entire banking industry would undoubtedly go through an upheaval of sorts, as sound banks thrive and unsound banks go the way of the investment banking industry of last year out of business as they should be. Those who are dependent on Fed welfare would have to clean up their act or shut down. Depositors would become intensely aware of which banks are sound and which are not. Returning again to the theme at the outset of this book, the only unique power that the Fed possesses is the power to inspire and support the creation of new money out of nothing. Who needs that? Banks like it. Governments like it. High-flying financiers like it. But the people do not benefit. Just the reverse. A lesson that was taught by the classical economists that remains true. There is no ideal supply of money in a society. Any quantity of money will do, so long as the quality of the money is sound. Prices adjust based on the existing money supply. New quantities of money injected to society confer no social benefit. If production rises and the money supply remains stable, the purchasing power of the money will rise. If production falls while the supply of money remains stable, the purchasing power of money will fall. 
We should think of money as nothing more than it was at its origin, a market created good that emerged out of trade. The most valuable commodity in society, the one good that could be traded for all other goods and thereby help facilitate complex exchange, emerges as money, whether that be beads or animal skins or jewels or precious metals. Gold became money because it had all the properties people look for in good money. Government had nothing to do with it. In an ideal world, the Fed would be abolished forthwith and the money stock frozen in place. That doesn't mean that there would be no more credit. Rather, credit would be rooted in money saved, not money created. Congress would remove the Fed's charter and the president would stop appointing Fed governors. Its buildings could be used for other purposes, perhaps bought by private banks that would operate as regular businesses. At the same time, the dollar would be reformed so that it again would become redeemable in gold. The federal government's gold stock could be used to guarantee this convertibility at home and abroad. All remaining powers associated with money could then be transferred to the U.S. Treasury, but now there would be a check on what government did with its power. The gold standard, with no Fed, would impose discipline. A new culture would emerge quickly in Washington. There would be a new clarity about the cost of wars in government programs. Just as in our household budgets in hard times, lawmakers would realize that they can't do all things. They must make choices. They must make cuts. Accounting rules would come to reign in ambitions just as the rest of the real world. We might even see the emergence of a new generation of political leaders who speak frankly and do what they say. While a gold standard would be a wonderful change, we shouldn't wait for one before we end the Fed. The dollar has a preeminent role in the world economy. It benefits from its long history as hard money. This will not change in a post-Fed world. The dollar could continue on as it is today and its value would start to rise once markets were convinced that the money supply would be fixed. The federal government would finance its operations the way that the state governments do today. Note that states do not have miniature central banks and they manage just fine. The money that the state governments spend is taken in by either floating bonds or by taxation. The legislators and executives are on such a short leash in every way. They raise or cut spending based on real factors. Also, the bonds issued by states and municipalities are evaluated and priced by the market. They contain a default premium based on their soundness. In the same way, without a Fed, the pricing of the debt of the federal government would become more realistic. There would be a built-in default premium that is absent from the current system, which deludes people into believing there is a such thing as 100% safe way to earn interest on money. I have no doubt that ending the Fed would lead to the introduction of a substantial discount on government-issued bonds relative to how they trade now, but this is a very good thing, a truth-telling moment. The value of the debt will fluctuate based on the market's assessment of government policy. Some new expensive war or corporate welfare program and the value would fall, as it should, meaning we would have fewer of both. An end to the money-creating power and a transfer of remaining oversight authority from the Fed to the Treasury would be marvelous steps in the right direction. But let us stretch these ideas a bit further and reconsider the entire idea of a government monopoly on money. The Founding Fathers never set out to create a single national monetary system. Money and banking were left to the states, with the proviso that the states themselves could only make gold and silver legal tender. At the same time, there were no restrictions on private minters and private or free banking. We should embrace this system again, repealing legal tender laws and letting everyone get into the business of the production of money. This would create a competitive market in which the best monies would emerge over time to compete directly with the federal government's dollar. This system is ever more viable in an age of digital trading and communication. Everyone with an internet connection now has the world financial system available at their fingertips. No longer should people be forced to use one money over another, and ev any and every monetary instrument should be made available to all. Let us put the power of free enterprise to work in the area of choosing which money is best. 
it surprises me that even with all the legal restrictions on alternative money and in payment systems, many gold currencies are today thriving on the internet, as well as complex private payment systems such as PayPal. The market will bring forth as many blessings in the area of monetary entrepreneurship as it does in all other goods and services, and it would be the same in banking. Banks would no longer be rewarded for leveraging deposits as high and as long as possible. Soundness and safety would be the marks of successful banks and their basis of profitability. So, why did I read you Ron Paul for 10 minutes? Well, because the debt ceiling debate rages on. And why? Well... The elites like to play a game where they scare you with something. <laughs> where they create dire circumstances. They wait for your reaction. They wait for that negative, that panic, that frenzy. And they wait for you to beg them for a solution. The state created a massive amount of problems very recently. You know what I'm talking about. You know that it leaked from a lab. You know that it's been used as an excuse for lockdowns. You know that it's been used as an excuse to shut down public schools, meaning more parents had to be home more, meaning less people could be at their jobs to begin with. You know that they shut down a lot of businesses because those businesses couldn't afford to comply with mandates. You know that this engaged the single greatest transfer of wealth from the low classes to the state and corporate classes ever. You know that they did this so that they can create a new world order one based on contact free payment systems contact tracing they did all this on purpose they want to break the system they want an excuse for new methods of surveillance under the guise of seeing if you're a little too warm. We we just want to see if you're a little too warm. That's why we're giving our cops helmets that have heads-up displays and can let them see every bit of your biometric data. Every bit of your biometric data and affiliated data, like your license plate information about where you are, GPS coordinates, your face, your gait, NASA's developing lasers that, uh, well they already developed them, but they're developing the technology more that can sense your heartbeat from a distance <laughs> and remotely detect who you are even if you're completely disguised and have no technology on you. Starlink means that there's no area of the world that's off the grid. Neuralink is run by the same people and it's directly putting itself into your brain. And the government is cranking up all this stuff because they want a massive system of control so that when the people realize exactly how much they've been fucked, or so that when people who already know that have enough time that they get fed up and do something about it, they'll have the ability to quickly tighten this iron grip, this massive security and surveillance super state predicated on the standing in foreign armies that are the police and the troops 
foreign policy has always been a mirror for the future of domestic policy, a crystal ball, if you will, that you can look into. However it is in foreign countries, especially the ones with which the U.S. are most charitable and most forgiving and most amiable, no matter the human rights abuses, those places will be the places that form the basis for this one. They wanted this system. But you know what this system requires? It requires funding. It requires infrastructure. And it requires a people too broken to do anything but fund it. Small businesses are much better at dodging taxes. They're much better at doing things under the table. They're much better at not being audited by some centralized authority. They can get away with more. They can do more. The more decentralized something gets, the freer it is. So, they of course couldn't allow a decentralized system at all. They had to rely on centralizing things as much as possible. So they gave all the power back to the corporations that they wanted to have that power to begin with. At least that's what they want. But it requires funding. Infrastructure like this requires funding. Biden has a baseline of $1 trillion and a potential uh, $3 trillion plus climate and social safety net bill. And there are a significant amount of people on both sides of the aisle, that being the center right, that being right over here, the center right of the authoritarian axis, that's where they all are. Biden is an authoritarian rightist. He's doing the same stuff as Trump, and some of it worse. There are more kids in cages than ever. There are more people being told don't come here than ever. There are border patrol agents fucking moving around on horses and whipping people as they're trying to come into the country. <laughs> it's, it's pretty absurd. It's fucking hilarious how absurd it is. And all of this is pretext because the authoritarian right that runs this country has decided four trillion dollars plus needs to be added. Now how do you pay for that? Well, money printing isn't free. Nothing's free. Money printing is expensive and it fucks the savings of everyone in the country at once, meaning they're generally opposed to it. So how do you get this infrastructure of control paid for? Well, you make part of that infrastructure of control blockchain-based ID and money systems that only the US government can audit, that only the US government can see. No longer is this blockchain going to be private, or sorry, public. It'll be private. It'll be privately audited by the US government. They get to see everything. You get to see nothing. FedCoin will be rolling out. They've already pretty much decided on it. 
they've already pretty much decided that it's going to be on this blockchain. That means they could, whenever they wanted, inject currency into the economy because the economy will no longer be based on physical wealth. It'll be based on digital dollars. They're calling it the Digital Dollar Project. You can look it up. I'm not making this up. And it's run by very similar parties. There's a lot of overlap to the people running ID2020. A blockchain-based biometric identification system. With the same private blockchain that the US government would and everybody else because ID2020 is global baby and probably the fed coin digital dollar would be global too because the US is going to use that as its new global reserve currency um, they get to use this to track you everywhere and to track your purchases to make sure that your purchases don't violate their codes, their edicts, their arbitrary bullshit. That's what it's there for. Including to make sure you're not organizing to rebel. Rebel against a four trillion dollar hit to the economy. Now, how do you get people okay with their purchasing power being destroyed how do you get people okay with this tragic loss of employment um, and this destroyed economy how do you get people okay with all of this like death to their savings their loss of retirement capability the fed coin also allows payments instantly and people have been saying since the beginning of this giant wealth and power transfer that wouldn't it be great if we just got like fourteen hundred dollars anyway wouldn't wouldn't this be more proof that we should have universal basic income and the people involved with modern monetary theory are all too happy to oblige The banksters are winning. And that's why they want to fuck with everything that is an alternative. That's why there's so much hysteria about cryptocurrencies being bad for the environment right now. Because if you can ignore the fact that banking currently requires trucks to pack up and physically transport physical money all across the fucking country if you can ignore the fact that banks around the world require massive server farms massive amounts of paperwork massive amounts of headquarters massive amounts of energy then you can say cryptocurrencies are bad for the environment, despite a significant amount of them running on sustainable funds, er, like f energy sources anyway. You can do that. Because you're a meaningless hack. You can ignore that the US dollar is much worse than cryptos. Hell, just like I said in my first angry vlog that I did, um... A bunch of gamers complaining about it is absolutely ironic because gaming takes up a fuck ton of carbon. You don't see them discouraging that because that's escapism. That lets us put our minds elsewhere. That's okay. That prevents rebellion. To a certain extent. I mean, it depends on uh, the game you play. But the general vibe I'm trying to give off here is that they need the Fed, they need central banking, they need this control mechanism and they're trying to scare people into accepting it by saying oh, you know 
we're coming up on that debt ceiling again. The one we've always lifted, the one we've always pushed up. We're coming up on that again. We're going to need y'all to get very scared and start begging the government for more support for whatever we do. So what we're going to do is we're going to tie the debt limit, the debt ceiling, to the infrastructure bill. And we'll say that if they can't agree on that infrastructure bill, we won't raise the debt ceiling and everything will collapse. All because of the meanies who didn't let us pump four trillion fucking dollars into the economy. The U.S. government, like, teetering on so much debt, collapsing any moment now, to be honest. If they don't kick the can down the road again. This is always what's going to happen. Always. Right now, according to the U.S. debt clock, the U.S. national debt is at $28 trillion. Rounded up to 29 because 28796 fuck it, 29. Debt per citizen is 86540 Debt per taxpayer is 228000 661. The GDP to deficit ratio is inverted. You couldn't tax this country 100% and pay for what this country already has. Much less $4 trillion in an infrastructure bill. How do they get you to not care about that? They want your brain to short circuit, so they scare the fucking shit out of you. As many times as they can. As much as they can. They tell you that without them, everything is going to collapse. Fucking V for Vendetta hours. Remind them why they need us. It's always like this. As David Icke would say, problem, reaction, solution. Control the narrative. Censor all dissenting speech. Claim that the new surveillance system is designed to prevent illness. <laughs> yeah, sure. Claim that the new... Four trillion dollar infrastructure package is for the people, <laughs> not for their control. All while you lash the increase of debt to an ever increasing debt ceiling that has never stopped increasing and won't as long as this corrupt institution is still in power. Lash all of that to the new biometrically sound blockchain super state where the technology that was created to liberate people and still is by the way just for now um, can be turned against them and in one fell swoop a lot of the freedom a lot of the capabilities just gone If your transactions are universally monitorable by the U.S. government, how can you buy and sell cryptocurrencies, which are valued in U.S. dollars? Oh. You can't. If your transactions are universally monitored, how can you buy any sort of weapons or gear to defend yourself from 
aggressors. You can't. If you need their new system to buy and sell, and they bar you from doing whatever you want with your body, even if you have a religious exemption, how can you follow your conscience legally? You can't. They want to remove your agency. They want to take away from you the last scraps of your personal autonomy. That's what they want to do. And how are they going to be able to do that? They got to get you on the dole. They got to make sure that you're forced by the economic situation they created onto their UBIs, that you are forced onto their surveillance system so that you are forced to accept whatever paradigm they fucking build for you. No matter how egregious, onerous, evil it is. Without the RFID chip, you're just an illegal alien and an enemy combatant of America. Welcome to New World Order. Megadeth. Prescient as always. I just thought I'd let you know that you don't have to accept this and you don't have to go quietly into this night. There are decentralization options. There are ways to raise your personal status now. I'm going to be trying for as many of those as I can. Don't know what I'm going to be able to afford, but I'm going to try to scrape around for whatever I can get before this eventual universal permanent lockdown throws at us because let me tell y'all when states collapse they grow the biggest right before they do so that they can try to control people and keep them in line and transfer to new forms of authority so that they can maintain their current level and increase their authority while not losing the people that they leech off of while not losing their tax cattle so they increase their power and then they force people on to that increased power whether or not people accept is what determines whether that society collapses or not and let me tell you, if rejecting this massive new tyranny that will be the biggest tyranny ever, that is already the biggest tyranny ever, if that makes society collapse, then fuck society. Joker had it right when he burned the money. They're lashing you to their system with it. The love of money is rooted in all ki is the root of all kinds of evil. You cannot serve both God and Mammon. More money, more problems. I've been doomsaying for a long time, and I've been right way too much of that time. And I've been disrespected at every turn by establishment shills and hacks and frauds and losers. But I'm going to keep talking about this stuff until I'm shut up permanently. Because many other people have been speaking out about this stuff for a long fucking time and nothing's been getting done. 
So maybe condensing it all into one neat package right before the fucking bomb explodes and entire societies are now dependent on the tyranny rather than can do it or not, maybe that might be enough. And if it's not, at least I can say I tried. Speaking the truth about what's coming is going to lose you people. It's not going to make you very popular or well-liked, but do it. Do it before it's too fucking late and you regret not having spoken the fuck up sooner. Because we don't have much fucking time. The clock has been ticking for a long time and people have been watching the hands move constantly distracted by one so they don't see what the other is doing and then suddenly time is up just like that so that's my hope is that you earn enough courage if you don't have it already and I hope you do because you're gonna need it in order to smash the fucking state